Good afternoon. Hi. When Deborah first contacted me and asked me to speak to you, she said, I said to Deborah, what would you like me to speak about? And she said, oh, well, just tell people how you were an entrepreneur and how you opened up Crow Cheese Restaurant in, Ga in the Gasland over 20, 25 years ago. But then about, I guess a couple weeks ago, I called Deborah and I said, hey, Deborah, how much time do I have to speak? And she said, oh, about 20 to 30 minutes. And panic set in. Because I wondered how in the world I could take my convoluted life story and put it into 30 minutes. Then I came up with it. I could tell you how I got a name. My name is Ingrid Croce Rock. Ingrid is my essence. It's who I am and who I always was growing up. Croce was my destiny. And the name Rock, it's my salvation. You see, I believe our names define us. It's our brand, it's our word. And if we follow our hearts and we work hard and we just keep away from the people who belittle our ambitions, we'll find our way. For me, with all the challenges that I've faced and the opportunities that I've offered, magically, I found my way to Croce's Restaurant and Jazz Bar. But it all started way back in the 1940s. World War II was over and my father, who was a captain in the army, returned to Europe from Europe and set up a practice, a medical practice, in the basement of our home. The neighbors in our diverse community were my father's patients, and I pretty much knew every one of them. Some folks had enough money to pay for my dad's medical services, but others who couldn't pay for it would just pay a part. And he never turned anyone away. He was the kindest, most generous man I have ever met. And when I grew up, I knew I wanted to be just like him and give back to my community. But I'm getting ahead of myself. It was 1947 when my father returned from the war and married my beautiful mother, Shirley. Nine months later, I was born. I rushed into the world weighing three pounds, four ounces, full of energy and ambition. Twelve minutes later, to everyone's astonishment but mine, my twin sister Phyllis followed. She was painting her nails and fixing her hair, and she weighed six and a half pounds, and she got to go home first and got her name. For another month, I stayed in the hospital and waited for my parents to get me. And when they did, I got a name. My name was Ingrid. I was named after Ingrid Bergman, my mother's favorite actress. My father told me that my name in German meant beautiful daughter. Intuitively, though, I knew that in English, my name must have meant persistence and hard work, because from the start, I was an overachiever with an insatiable quest for mealtime. I loved food and all the circumstance, ceremony, and people that went along with it. I remember that every other Saturday, we would visit my father's mother, Ida, and I'd rush out of the car to learn how to make my favorite meals. I love the feeling of working with my hands and learning how to make blintzes and knishes and chicken soup and matzo balls. And there were no recipes back then. It was just like a pinch of this and a pinch of that. But miraculously, dinner arrived to the table and we all sat down and ate together. Mary was my mother's mother. She had a different appeal. She was a businesswoman with her own dress stores on South Street. And when I visited her, I'd run upstairs to the alterations, I'd make my own clothes, count cash, and watch my grandmother manage her staff. When I was hungry, I could enjoy a Philadelphia cheesesteak, soul food, Chinese egg rolls, and Italian cannolis all in one day. I like that. My mother was a dark-haired, dark-eyed beauty. Sometimes she worked at the dress store, but often she played piano at home, and I would learn to sing with her. She had her own local TV show called The Magic Lady, where she would play Gershwin, and she would also play popular hits from the hit parade, portraying a mysterious lady. In real life, she was pretty mysterious, too. Sometimes, without any warning, she'd disappear for a week, a month sometimes, and I never understood where she was going. When I was five, my parents were divorced, and I learned that my mother's disappearing act was the treatments, was about the treatments she was getting for her drug and alcohol addiction. My dad said he had done his very best to help her with her drug addiction, but he couldn't, couldn't do it and it didn't work. 
My father wanted my sister and I to have a stable upbringing, so he took us to live with my Aunt Ruth, Uncle Ray, and my cousin Judy in North Philadelphia. Every single night, after his office hours, he'd come to join us for our evening meal. And from then on, dinner wasn't just delicious. It had a symbolized feeling of commitment and trust. I loved my dad more than anything. And when I was seven, I was so happy that he met my stepmother, Florence. When they married, we went back to live with them in West Philadelphia in our own home, and I attended my second, second grade. That same year, when Phyllis and I turned eight, we were summoned to court by the attorneys. We had to testify in front of the judge and our parents to tell them where we wanted to live, with our mother or our father. At eight, I'd hardly seen my mother in three years, so I told them honestly that I wanted to live with my dad because I felt safe there. I didn't know back then that children didn't have the opportunity to choose and that children went directly with their mom no matter what. So I hurt my mother's feelings for no reason at all and then a long and very angry, bitter custody battle ensued and I got my first real taste of litigation. Within the week, I was forced to move in with my mother and my grandmother, Mary. We attended Friends Select School, private school, we lived across the street from Rittenhouse Square. We had beautiful clothes and everything any kid could want. But all I ever wanted was to live with my dad. Divorce back then was such a scandal. And I was made to feel like an outcast. I never felt like I fit in. Then something really important happened when I was in third grade. It was during history class. Teacher Jean asked all of the students if anyone knew how to dance the Irish jig. And I raised my hand immediately and I said, I can do it, I know how to dance the Irish jig. Immediately, Teacher Jean looked at me and she said, Ingrid, I don't think you do know how to dance the Irish jig. Well, that was a dare. So even though I'd never danced the Irish jig, I knew I could do it. And I knew I could teach others to do it too. I was a song and dance girl like my mom. So finally, Teacher Jean gave in, and she handed me the record of Irish music. And she said, come back tomorrow, Ingrid, and show everyone how you dance the Irish jig. Right after school, all my friends and I used to hang out at the house and dance to the songs of American Bandstand. So I had everyone come over, and we practiced the dance that I had created. The next day, my classmates cheered me on, and even, even Teacher Jean was impressed. My success that day cemented my faith in my instincts, and in my ability to take risks. I knew I could jump in with two feet and always land out okay. I could survive it. I was always busy. I was always active, running, playing field hockey, cheerleading, gymnastics, making art, performing in school plays, and finally, I was a turned on teenager, dancing to bandstand. Because my mother had her own TV show, I got to sing on TV with the Andrews sisters. I got to meet Harry Belafonte, Frank Sinatra, and even the Three Stooges. But also because of my mother's addictions, I had this deep desire to be healthy. I always ate well, I did my gymnastics, and I worked very hard to keep my mother safe. Then, just before I turned 16, the doctor told us that my mother had breast cancer. Two months later, while my sister and I were in gym class, the school counselor called me to her office and she said that my mother had died. She was only 35 years old, and I was so sad that she never got well. It was a bittersweet return to my dad's house. Just as suddenly as we moved in downtown, we moved out to the suburbs. We attended Springfield High. It was the 60s, and so much was going on. While I still loved rock and roll, three guys from school asked me if I'd sing with their group, and I did. And then when we performed at the Pennsylvania Military College, six handsome cadets said, would you like to join our group? And I said, yes. <laughs> they were the rum runners. They wanted to audition for this big hootenanny down at convention center, and I practiced with them every single day after school. In December 1963, we all drove to the radio station for an audition, and our car got stuck in the snow. Automatically, I jumped out all by myself, leaving my band of six cadets behind me, and I pushed our car over a big snowdrift, just as this green VW drove up. I waved at the car with my mittens on, and then I saw the cutest guy I'd ever seen. 
I was so embarrassed, I jumped back into the, into the car and drove off to make sure we had our audition on time. But once we were in the studio, I recognized in the control booth that that same cute guy that had come to help us was in there, and he was the judge. We sang our three folk songs, and Jim Croce, a sophomore at Villanova, came out to tell us that we'd won our audition. He walked over to me, tripping over the cord that was attached to the microphone, and said, I'd like to introduce myself. And then he said, do you sing rock and roll? Maybe we could sing together sometime. I was just a sophomore in high school, and I wanted to look so cool and grown up. So I borrowed a really sexy white dress with black stripes running up the side. I wore my hair long and dark like Joan Baez, and I had black boots up to my, up to my hips almost. And uh, when Jim saw me, he said, oh, you look really cute. And then, inserting his foot in his mouth, he said, just like a little skunk. <laughs> I felt so terrible, and he knew it. He knew it. He knew it hurt my feelings, so he quickly asked if he could tune my guitar and play me a song. I had absolutely no idea that there was a treat in my, in my future. Jim had the most beautiful voice I'd ever heard. And from then on, music forged a passionate bond between us. We became a duo, singing in coffee houses and in college concerts all over the area, spending every minute that we could together. When it was time for me to go away to college, I decided that I wanted to be an artist or a psychiatrist. So I applied to RISD and Penn. And when I got accepted first at Rhode Island School of Design, I decided I was going to pursue my, my career as an artist. While I was a freshman at RISD, Jim wrote me every day and sent me tapes of love songs. He saved up all his money and bought me a diamond ring. And that summer we were married, when I was just 19, and our lives together were an adventure every step of the way. My new name, Croce, means cross in Italian, so it also meant passion, and there were many trials and tribulations to come. A week before we married, Jim received a letter from the Army National Guard that was telling him that he was going to be leaving for Fort Jackson, South Carolina the next week. Then we learned that my poor father had colon cancer. Three months after Jim left, he received an early hardship discharge, and we returned just in time to say goodbye to my dear dad. For three years, Jim worked odd jobs to put me through college. While we continued to write and sing songs together, dreaming of one day having music careers, I was still in art school. Then during my senior year, we were offered the opportunity to do an album on Capitol Records called Jim and Ingrid Croce, and we took it. We moved to New York City and traveled 100,000 miles a year for two years straight on a college concert circuit. We sang and ate our way across America, becoming truck stop gourmets. We were broke, but we were really happy. And we would have continued to do that, but when we ran out of money and we had no place else to go, we went to a little small farmhouse in Pennsylvania. And naive to our contractual agreements, we thought we were clear. Soon after we came there, our friends and fellow musicians, Arlo Guthrie, the Manhattan Transfer, Bonnie Raitt, James Taylor, all came to our house, and I loved making meals out of our garden for them. 